After five days, Ananias the high priest came down with the elders and the lawyer named Tertullus. These men presented their case against Paul to the governor. When he was called in, Tertullus began to accuse him and said, Since we enjoy great peace because of you, and reforms are taking place for the benefit of this nation by your foresight, we acknowledge this in every way and everywhere, most excellent Felix, with the most gratitude. However, so that I will not burden you any further, I beg you in your graciousness to give us a brief hearing. For we have found this man to be a plague, an agitator among all the Jews throughout the Roman world, and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. He even tried to desecrate the temple, so we apprehended him, and wanted to judge him according to our law, but Lysias the commander came and took him from our hands with great force, commanding his accusers to come to you. By examining him yourself, you will be able to discern all these things we are accusing him of. The Jews also joined in the attack, alleging that these things were so. When the governor motioned for him to speak, I replied, because I know you have been a judge of this nation for many years, I am glad to offer my defense in what concerns me. You can verify for yourself that it is no more than 12 days since I went up to, to worship in Jerusalem. They didn't find me arguing with anyone or causing a disturbance among the crowd, either in the temple or in the synagogues or anywhere in the city. Neither can they prove the charges they are now making against me. But I admit this to you, I worship the God of my ancestors according to the way, which is which they call a sect, believing everything that is in accordance with the law and written in the prophets. I have a hope in God which these men themselves also accept, that there will be a resurrection, both the righteous and the unrighteous. I always strive to have a clear conscience toward God and men. After many years, I came to bring charitable gifts and offerings to my people. While I was doing this, some Jews from Asia found me ritually purified in the temple, without a crowd and without any uproar. It is they who ought to be here before you to bring charges if they have anything against me. Or else let these men themselves say what room for wrongdoing they found when I stood before the council. Other than this one thing that I cried out was standing among them, it is with respect to the resurrection of the dead and that I am on trial before you this day. But Felix, having a rather accurate knowledge of the way, put them off, saying, When Lysias the tribune comes down, I will decide your case. Then he gave orders to the centurion that he should be kept in custody but have some liberty, and that none of his friends should be prevented from attending to his needs. After some days, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, and he sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. And as he reasoned about righteousness and self-control and his coming judgment, Felix was alarmed and said, Go away for the present. When I get an opportunity, I will summon you. At the same time, he hoped that money would be given him by Paul. So he sent for him often and conversed with him. When two years had elapsed, Felix was succeeded by Porcius Festus. And desiring to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. Okay, thank you. All right, so let's get into verse 1 here, and we'll just go on down like we normally do. So five days later, the high priest Ananias went down to Caesarea with some of the elders and a lawyer named Tertullus, or Tertullus, I'm not sure that's a pronunciation, you should look it up, and they brought their charges against Paul before the governor. So we meet Ananias once again. Do you guys remember what we said about him previously, what kind of character he is? He wasn't exactly a law follower. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, not a law follower. And not particularly a good good person. <laughs> Certainly not a good Jew, it seems. And uh, all right, so. We, uh, the high priest, so these are these are the people coming down to make this charge, right? It's against Paul. Went down to Caesarea with some of the elders, and so these elders were probably some of the same elders that were working in conjunction with the 40 men who were trying to assassinate Paul. So this is kind of the people who, that were, who 
were bringing the case against him. And a lawyer, uh, which is pretty much precisely what it sounds like, somebody who was hired to uh, hired in these legal matters to present the case. And it's not really made clear whether he is a Jew, this lawyer. There are some things in what he says that indicates he could be, but then there's other things where he kind of disassociates himself from the Jews just by his language, so it's not necessarily very clear. But, whatever the case, they're coming against Paul and trying to bring this case against him. So when Paul, verse 2, when Paul was called in, uh, Tertullus pr presented his case before Felix. So this is the case, so he's, he's beginning here. We have enjoyed a long period of peace under you, and your foresight has brought about reforms in this nation. Everywhere and in every way, most excellent Felix, we acknowledge this with profound gratitude. But in, no, but in order not to weary you further, I would request that you be kind enough to hear us briefly. So, I'll say a little bit more about some of the details of this introduction, but just right off the bat, what jumps out to you about this introduction or how he's beginning his case? <laughs> What's it seem like he's doing? Sucking up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think that's <laughs> precisely what he's doing. Uh, he's using a lot of this flattering language, and not all of it is very <clears throat> accurate about uh, Felix. So, he says here in verse 2, When Paul is called into Jules, or presented his case before Felix, <coughs> we have enjoyed a long period of peace under you, and your foresight has brought about reforms in this nation. So, that word foresight, or it might be providence in your translation, had this connotation in, um, in the ancient world here of divine action, really. And so what he was saying is how his, his actions and all these reforms that he had brought in this nation were kind of divine in nature, and it's just really, really puffing them up, and uh, not, not exactly truthful, uh, as I'll talk about, about the, the history of Felix and all, some of what he's about to do in a little bit. But... And that was, that kind of providence or foresight was often spoken of only to Caesar. So he's using this language and, and it's addressed to someone who's pretty far below Caesar. And then in verse 3, everywhere and in every way, most excellent Felix, once again, most excellent is, uh, well, actually, I was supposed to read from the commentator here. He says a lot more better than I could. So, in customary fashion for addressing a governor, Tertullus called him most excellent, a term which was normally reserved for members of the equestrian order, which is a social, social class just beneath the rank of senators. Felix, however, had not come to his position from the equestrian order, but rather from the status of freedman. So, we talked a little bit about Felix's origins last week, but even this tied, even how he's addressing him and saying most excellent, that was stretching the truth because it wasn't actually taking his past into consideration and how he rose to this position in the first place. So we acknowledge this with profound gratitude to all this elaborate language. But in order not to weary you further, I would request that you be kind enough to hear us briefly. So <laughs> he's essentially saying, you know, we don't want to detain you for too long from these great and wondrous things that you're doing. You know, you have more important work to get on than, um, onto than just what we're about to present. So we'll just try to do it quickly. We can get out of here. Uh, just uh, like I said, all this kind of flattery and language that <laughs> stretches the truth quite a, quite a bit. And so that's the first fill in the blank there. Tertullus' speech was marked by flattery and statements which stretched the truth. Tertullus's speech was marked by flattery and statements which stretched the truth. And then, after this this introduction where he's just trying to <laughs> appease this guy. He actually gets into the case here. Verse 5, We have found this man to be a troublemaker, stirring up riots among the Jews all over the world. 
He is a ringleader of the Nazarene sect and even tried to desecrate the temple. So we seized him. By examining, your, by examining him yourself, you will be able to learn the truth about all these charges we are bringing against him. The Jews joined in the accusation, asserting that these things were true. All right, so um, this lawyer brings these three charges, three accusations against Paul. Okay? So this first one we have here in verse 5. We found this man to be a troublemaker which literally, that word in Greek means uh, a pest, uh, a plague, or like a pestilence, something along those lines. So it's very emotionally derogative language, derogatory language, that's, that's saying that this guy is just the worst. He's, he's no good. He's causing all these issues, uh, and, and uh, it's meant to intentionally cause some sort of reaction. So that's 2A, so that's the first accusation that was brought against him. He instigated trouble and chaos wherever he went. He instigated trouble and chaos wherever he went. So, Gracie, I didn't explain this, my bad. But number two is there were three accusations brought against Paul. Oh. And then under that would be 2A, 2B, and 2C. And so, the first one, 2A, was he instigated trouble and chaos wherever he went. Yeah, I know. What what a troublemaker. And that's probably in reference to, you know, uh, we've already seen a lot of stories so far in Acts where things didn't go so, so well for Paul in these towns, and there were some uproars and things like that, and all these, these mobs and riots. And so it's definitely twisting the truth to some degree because he's trying to make it sound like there's some political attack here on Paul's part that's, that could cause this, um, where he's trying to undermine the, the political authorities, which is not the case because Paul's message, the message of the gospel, never had anything to do with attacking the, the political sphere. And in fact, Christians would have made really good citizens. <laughs> right. Yeah, so we know... Mm -hmm. Right. Right, yeah, exactly. So we know from Paul's own teaching in other areas that, yeah, this was this was a false accusation, uh, just as... You know, we'll, we'll get into that. But that was the first one that was brought up against him. He instigated trouble and chaos for everyone. He's like, this judge, this guy's just the worst. He's doing all this bad stuff. And so the, uh, the second one, second accusation is also at the end of five. So he is a ringleader of the Nazarene sect. Uh, so that's the second one. So it's saying that, well, one, one commentator I read said that, that language, we can read that like the Nazarene sect, and we automatically assume that that's some, something that's meant to be negative in a way, like all the Nazarene sect, we kind of think that's a bad thing. But here, there was, there were some differing opinions on this that I read, but some said that just because of how it called, how it describes the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees as sort of like the sect of the Pharisees, it's more of like a descriptor than actually something that has some of these negative connotations with it. And then another one said that this was actually intended to be derogatory, but Whatever the case, that's that's the way he's described. He's the ringleader of the Nazarene sect. So, an in interesting way. Why do you think he called him specifically the this Nazarene sect? It's kind of a low ball, but or a soft ball. But. I think it's kind of the same way he was part of a cult. Cult. Yeah, potentially that's what one of them was kind of thinking. But that Nazarene, right? So that's, I mean, we know Jesus was from Nazareth. Yeah, so, so I mean, even, even Jesus is kind of addressed in that way in uh, one of the early chapters in the book of John. So this was a, this is the first time that we've seen this sort of language, but that's, it's very intentionally, that's what he's, that's what he's talking about. But it does carry this idea that it's some sort of this new new religion kind of deal. And that's that's where his argument lies. He's, he's saying that there's this new new religion, new deal, and obviously what he with what he's just stated, 
stated saying that this is the leader of this thing and he's causing all these issues and so this is this is a bad deal this this uh, the way that the, these Christians these are these are bad bad people so we're not going to be helpful to the the uh, whole society so that was to be he was the leader of this new religion <laughs> which is kind of funny he was called that the leader he was the leader of this new religion but he was certainly one of the more prominent representations. That's true. He's the leader of this new religion, to be. <coughs> and now we get to the third accusation here, in verse 6. And he even tried to desecrate the, te desecrate the temple. So he seized him. So what's this in reference to, if you remember? Right. Some people assume that they did. Yeah. Yeah. So, right. When they got to Jerusalem, so they, they had seen that Trophimus, the Gentile, was with Paul and had assumed, like you said, Don, that he had brought Trophimus, the Gentile, into, uh, into the temple area, which was strictly forbidden by the law. And so, if that had been true, that would have been a breaking of that law. But that's not what happened, as Luke kind of gives us the insight on it. A few, few chapters earlier, but that was the third. That was the third accusation, and and you can see here that he didn't say that he did do this, but he said that and he tried to do this. You know, so it's it's again he's he's trying to twist the narrative in his favor a little bit. He's trying to kind of skew the facts to support his position and, and to bring these accusations against Paul. which we'll, we'll, we'll talk about in a moment in Paul's response to these things. So that's the th uh, 2C. He tried to profane the temple. <clears throat> tried to profane the temple. And... So you might... Have uh, verse seven in your Bibles, depending on I think probably what translation you have, or you might have a footnote about it. And that well, it says uh, it's mine. This footnote here in this uh, this Bible says some manuscripts. Him it says him and wanted to judge him according to our law. And then verse seven, but the commander Lysias came. And with the use of much force, snatched him from our hands. And then it continues on in verse 8. So that just wasn't in all the manuscripts, the verse 7. They, they didn't find that in all the manuscripts. And uh, probably not the best ones either. And so they just, there was good evidence that this wasn't, that verse wasn't original to the text. So we'll see, they'll do that. We talked about this. That's, that's already happened. I think Acts um, 8 verse 37 is an example. And we talked about that before, just how it's what's in the realm of textual criticism, and so they try to try to do their best to to um, copy down, to write down what they think is pretty original, to what the what the writers actually wrote down, and so they'll they'll try to go back to the oldest and best manuscripts and see if there's harmony in there between to, to find out what what the authors actually wrote. So that's just what we have there for, for the lack of verse 7. And then he, he kind of concludes there, although this may have, Luke may have not just been recounting this, his whole speech, but uh, was potentially just summarizing it here in the text. In verse 8, by examining him yourself, you'll be able to learn the truth about all these charges we're bringing against him. So that word examining often meant torture and trying to figure out what was going on. So that was definitely encouraged in what Tertullus was trying to say. It's like, you know, if you, if you torture him and try to, try to squeeze some info out of him, you might be able to figure out what's going on, which is similar to what they were trying to do when they were going to flog him. So that's, that's the, uh, the desire of the, the Jewish position. And so verse 9, the Jews joined in the accusation asserting that all these things were true. <laughs> All right, so 
<laughs> then we can then we continue on. This is, this is pretty good. I like this chapter a lot. When the governor motioned for him to speak, so this is directed towards Paul, Paul replied, I know that for a number of years you have been a judge over this nation, so I gladly make my defense. Okay, so immediately we have a difference between Tertullus's, this lawyer's introduction and how he's presenting his case, and then Paul's. So Tertullus was trying to really flatter the guy. Felix and, and say all these things that were not true about him, but just to kind of puff up his, uh, his hubris. And then Paul, on, in, in his introduction, says something along the, well, what's essentially communicated here is that He's known that Felix has been the governor, and so he's been the he's been very closely associated with the dealings in Judea and Samaria for ten years, and so he's so he's saying that I know that you have a good understanding of of Jews in in some of this culture over here, and so I'm I'm confident that you'll be able to see what's going on here. So that's why he's saying this. He's saying I'm glad that I'm dealing with you because you have a pretty good under, a good understanding. Of some of the some of the intimate de details of, of the Jews and how they function, and the Jewish law as well, and so we also will also see a little bit later that he has familiar he has a good deal of good deal of familiarity with Christians also. But anyways, that's what he's saying here. So he's saying something true about Felix, and, and it's not twisting of the truth in any way or trying to I don't know flatter him. So verse 12, my accusers did not find me arguing with anyone at the temple or stirring up a crowd in the synagogues uh, or anywhere else in the city, and they cannot prove to you the charges they are, they are now making against me. So he addresses his first accusation here, and kind of his point is in all of this is that I wasn't there long enough to do any of this stuff. He says, I, haven't, haven't, I wasn't in Jerusalem long enough to cause all this trouble that they're saying that I caused and all this, all this, all these uproars and things like that. So and he says, you can easily verify that no more than 12 days ago I went up to Jerusalem to worship. And so his intention in going to Jerusalem as well, it makes it clear that he wasn't trying to cause any dissension with the Jews or anything of the sort. Instead, he was going up to do a very honorable thing by the Jews, which was to worship, which is what the Jews were, would, uh, would have approved of. And uh, we know that Paul was trying to come in for Pentecost, so I mean, this, was the, this was Christian in nature. But still, uh, he was, had very honorable motives. <clears throat> My accusers, he goes on to say in verse 12, so these people who are coming against him with these accusations... They, they did not find me arguing with anyone at the temple or stirring up a crowd in the synagogues or anywhere else in the city. So all these things that they're saying, that didn't happen. And they cannot prove to you the charges they are now making against me. So, I mean, it's a very logical argument that he's, that he's presenting here. He's saying that they don't have a case because there's no verifiable evidence that I've done any of those things. And I have evidence of coming into town recently and all of my actions can be accounted for by these people. So it's, it's a bad case that they're bringing up against him. And so he is, it's, it's a very reasonable way that he presents this, which we know that Paul is pretty reasonable with, as we have seen so far in Acts. However, I admit, it goes on to say in verse 14, I admit that I worship the God of our fathers as a follower of the way, which they call a sect. I believe everything that agrees with the law and that is written in the prophets, and I have the same hope in God as these men, that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked, so I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. So here he is addressing the, the second accusation that's brought up against him. So the lawyer was saying that he's this the, the leader of this new religion, this new way, and it seems pretty clear from, from the lawyer's perspective that, and from the Jews' perspective that they think that Paul's whole deal and his religion has nothing to do with, with Judaism or, is, or shouldn't be connected with it because it's its own thing and he's crazy, he's nuts, and all that. And so 
What does Paul do here, kind of in response to this? How does he describe Christianity? Says he worships according to the law, mm -hmm. according to the same as the Jews. Yeah, which makes it not a new religion, right? But I mean, what is what is uh, what is Christ called? Uh, I think specifically in the book of Hebrews. Uh, I think that's it. I'm going to fact check the Indian on that. But he is the the fulfillment of the law, right? So this is, in Paul's mind, this is not, he's not the leader of this new religion. Instead, he's saying that I'm simply doing what the law calls for in, uh, in worshiping Christ, who is the, the promised Messiah. And so, so he's trying to make the argument that this is, this is not a new way, but I am actually still a Jew. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I follow Jesus, who is our Messiah. And I believe in the resurrection. He's, he points out the similarities between him and, uh, and the Pharisees. And what's funny is that he has those same ideas about the resurrection from the dead that the Pharisees do. And the whole, the whole thing is how Paul and the way is pitted against Judaism uh, in their minds, in the Jews' minds. But the funny thing is that the Jews and the Sadducees are even more at odds with one another theologically because they believe these totally different things about the resurrection and all these spiritual beings and such, and the, the Sadducees don't even accept, accept the prophets and the scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures. So <laughs> there's so much, Paul's just pointing out that there's so much similarity um, between, between his position and the Jews um, because he's a Jew <laughs> and he's a Pharisee. Uh, well, <coughs> not by their minds, but he's, I mean, he was, uh, he was, a uh, he, he is a keep, keeper of the law. Now he's the leader, he's one of these more prominent men in, uh, in Christianity. So, oh, okay, I haven't finished yet. Alright, so, <clears throat> and, let me see here. Okay. Alright, here we go. So that was verse through verse uh, 16. So I, so I strive always to keep my, co my conscience clear before God and man. Verse 17, after an absence of several years, which Reese notes is at least four years, so after, four, after at least four years, I came to Jerusalem to bring my people gifts for the poor and to present offerings. So we talked about that part of the, on his way to the trip, on his way back to Jerusalem, how he was collecting these these offerings, these financial gifts from the Gentile churches and places that he had been traveling in order to support the poor uh, people, the poor Christians in, in uh, Jerusalem. And so that's what, that's what he was coming to bring, which is, once again, a pretty honorable thing, and to present his offerings. I was, ceremoni I was ceremonially clean right, when they found me in the temple courts doing this. We talked about how he participated in... The, the other men's Nazarite vow, right? How he kind of joined that, and uh, and he had, he had done the ceremonial cleansing, the, the week long ceremonial cleansing. So he had done that. So he was he was clean, he was pure, and they found me in the temple courts doing this. There was no crowd with me, nor was I involved in any disturbance. So if he had brought in Trophimus the Gentile at that time, then there would have been a disturbance. There would have been some kind of um, crowd and, and uproar. Just, but he says, none of that happened. And, and so this kind of addresses the last one, that he didn't profane the temple. He didn't do that either, because the way he acted in there was in accordance with the Jewish law. <coughs> Verse 19, but there, there are some Jews from the province of Asia who ought to be here before you and bring charges if they have anything against me. Or those who are here should state what crime they found in me when I stood before the Sanhedrin. So what he's saying here is that these people aren't even the original ones 
who had this initial issue with me. <laughs> so these, remember how the Asian um, Jews that were, we, we thought they were probably the ones from Ephesus, had come in and, and kind of started this whole thing when they saw Paul in Jerusalem, right? We talked about that and, and studied that. And so he's saying that these, these eyewitnesses, supposed eyewitnesses of this, these supposed crimes that have been committing and all these bad things that I've been doing, they're not even here to present this case. They're not even the ones who, who were first kind of upset with all of this stuff. But now we have these people here, these Jews here, who are trying to make a case against me, who are, who are going off of rumors. <laughs> this is all hearsay that, that I've done these things. And so these people aren't even eyewitnesses of any of these hypothetical things that they're, they're, they're saying that I did. Uh, yeah, so, right, so verse 20, or, or these who are here should state what crime they found in me when I stood before the Sanhedrin. So it seems that they were there at that time, unless it was this one thing I shouted as I stood in their presence. It is concerning the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you today. Speaking about, we, we went through that last week, but how he was talking about the resurrection when he perceived that the, the, there were the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees there. It was a strategic move, but... That's what he did. And so he admits that uh, maybe that's what they're uh, upset about, but that's really the only thing that, that he, uh, he gives way on. Uh, but even then, that's not a point of contention because he believes the same as the Pharisees in that, in that way. So his defense, where the lawyer's defense was, like we said, marked by this, this flattery, and the stretching of the truth, the twisting of the truth. And we know that even then, all of these things weren't actually witnessed grievances. <clears throat> they weren't crimes that any of the Jews there had actually seen happen. It was just things that they had heard about and uh, all these rumors that were going around trying to slander Paul. And so that they brought this case before him. And... Uh, it's, it's pretty embarrassing because they didn't have any, the evidence to do that. And so for number three there, and you're filling the blanks, Paul's defense was marked by truth and verifiable evidence. Paul's defense was marked by truth and verifiable evidence. So, I mean, we know just from reading his letters how intelligent Paul was, right? And he's just, <laughs> he's, he is an incredibly smart man. And, uh, and he knows, he, he knows that there isn't a case against him, not one that's reasonable anyhow. And so he uses that to his advantage and just says, nope, none of this is true. And uh, I, I, <laughs> I have all of these people who can, who can account for me and uh, none of this is verifiable. And so he finishes his defense, and then in verse 22, it says, Then Felix was well acquainted with the way, so he also knew about Christians and Christianity, adjourned the proceedings. When Lysias, the commander, comes, he said, I will decide your case. So he, so he tells them all to, to go away until a later date. He ordered the centurion to keep Paul under guard, but to give him some freedom and permit his friends to take care of his needs. So he, uh, with, with him giving Paul some freedom, as it says, it means that he wouldn't have been under some, like, as strict of a punishment or, or any kind of, I don't know, disciplinary actions, I guess, wouldn't have been, wouldn't have been taken to miss if he had been harsh on him. Uh, as opposed to be doing that. And then also, we get this little note here, which you guys might know some in history about that. Maybe we've talked about it before. I can't remember. But he says, but to give him some freedom and permit his friends to take care of his needs. So why was that important just in, in that well, day and age? They didn't feed you in prison, did they? Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. Right. So it wasn't like prisons as we know it today were... You get a TV, and <laughs> I mean, there, and you have your, your your meal times and clothing and all that kind of stuff. So I mean, they didn't the, the Romans they didn't provide any of that any of that sort of thing, and so it was all left to 
people you knew to come and, and give you all that stuff. So he allows that to happen. Felix allows Paul's friends to, to come and take care of him in that way. Is this uh, unusual in any way that being detained but then like having more freedom? Well, not, not unusual, no. I mean, it just kind of depended on the seriousness of the crime committed. But with all of this stuff that Paul's been accused of and, if, and all of this uh, legal things and proceedings that have gone on, it seems like, and with all, I mean, the truth that came over with him, right? remember there were 470 people, so this seems like he did something really bad. And uh, it's kind of shocking for his case because maybe if it was just like a minor crime, you know, you'd be put in jail and your friends would have to come and take care of you or something like that. But for something who supposedly did all these horrific things, I guess it would be kind of odd that, that uh, he would be allowed these liberties. But then again, Felix seems to have some sort of perception and, uh, and knows that he's not guilty of these things. And in fact... It's, I think that Felix would have just let him go scot-free. I mean, he, he would have been like, yeah, there's, none, of this is, none of this is legitimate uh, coming against Paul. But Felix had some ulterior motives of trying to get some, some money from Paul. And so he, he, uh, he kept him uh, when he really shouldn't have because there, there wasn't a case against him. What do you think about that sentence there? It says Felix was afraid and said, that's enough for now. Yeah, we're going to get to that. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, it's an interesting it's an interesting response to what Paul did, and yeah, we'll actually we'll we'll just get into that. We got we got a few minutes. Let's try to finish out here. <clears throat> so verse twenty four. So several days later, Felix came with his wife Drusilla, who was a Jewess. And he sent for Paul and listened to him as he spoke about faith in Christ and Jesus. All right. So real quick, I wanted to read this some of the historical context about Drusilla, and it'll give us some indication of why Felix acts the way he responds, the way he does, I think. So while Paul was in, Ces uh, in Caesarean imprisonment, Felix and Drusilla came to visit him. Luke notes that Drusilla was a Jewish, Jewess, sorry, a detail given perhaps to indicate why the procurator was interested in seeing Paul. Drusilla's story would make, an inter would make entertainment headlines today. <laughs> the youngest daughter of Agrippa I, the Herod of Acts 12. She was married at age 14 to Azizus, king of Emesa, a Syrian petty state. When Felix saw the beautiful young woman, uh, woman he, he wanted her for his wife, employing the services of, an <laughs> My gosh, I can't read. of a magician named Atomos. He convinced her to leave her husband when she was 16. He promised her that he could give her true happiness. When she married Felix, she was his third wife. Eventually, she bore him a, a son named Agrippa, who later died in the eruption in Mount Edna of Mount Vesuvius. So, it's kind of a scandalous history on Felix's and Drusilla's part. So, it's interesting about that, about their history. And so, what Paul does, he sent for Paul. Excuse me. Now, he, she was the daughter of, of who? She was the... Uh, daughter, the youngest daughter of Agrippa I. So this, this is the Herod of Acts 12 who died from, because he didn't give glory to God, right? Remember? And he was eaten with worms. So this was a pretty horrific death. But, uh, okay. So there's that. That's the piece, the point of connection there. This thing is so squeaky. It's driving me crazy. I gotta stop chasing it. <laughs> it's my fault. So, so Felix sends for Paul and listened to him as he spoke about faith in Christ Jesus. Very interesting. Verse 25, as Paul discoursed on righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and said, that's enough for now. You may leave. When I find it convenient, I will send for you. So Paul comes in and preaches the gospel to, to Felix and Drusilla. That's what he does. He uses this opportunity, even though he's imprisoned, to, to do this, to present the, the, um, the good news to, to Felix and Drusilla. So as Paul discoursed on righteousness, and so Luke mentions these three things. It's discourse on righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. Felix was afraid and said, that's enough for now, you may leave. So what does it seem like convicted Felix, in a way? 
just based on what we just read about that. Yeah. <coughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, some of that language that, that Paul would have used and how he was talking about all these things and righteousness, being upright, having this self-control, and then the judgment. So that's coming for everybody, right? And that struck a chord, an emotional chord with Felix, and uh, he, couldn't, he couldn't take it. So he was convicted and didn't respond in repentance, but he, he responded in another way by, by saying, I don't want to hear any more of this, which usually that's, you'll get one of the two. <laughs> be like someone saying, shut up, get away from me, or someone saying, what must I do to be saved, right? As the, uh, the Roman guard said, if you remember that. Sorry for this tangent, but what did the typical Roman believe about uh, uh, deity or afterlife? Yeah, I'm not sure about per the particulars of the afterlife. I mean, it was the pagan society, so there were the, the number of gods that they believed in, and... Uh, had control over the very various aspects of life, of course, since it was um, um, polytheistic in nature. But I think that they probably had different. I mean, there were some of the philosophic. We we talked about like the Stoics, right, and the Epicureans, and the different different um, groups, the, these different philosophical groups. And so they, did, they believed different things about the end. I mean, some said that there wasn't anything and that you would just die and nothing happened. Um, some said that there, were, there was something. So there were different ideas at the time about what was to come. Mm -hmm. But the idea of this resurrection from the dead uh, into a bot, like this bodily resurrection, uh, I think <clears throat> was... Don't quote me on this, but I think it was exclusive to, to Judaism in this area. Well, Rome as a whole believed in Jupiter and right. Dionysus and all that other stuff. Mm -hmm. That held a belief in the realm of the dead, uh, which yeah. was pretty much like a miserable existence. And right. you had yeah, choices, 80s. you went to the realm of the dead, if you drunk the water as you crossed it, it would at least give you, uh, it would wipe your memory so you wouldn't know you were suffering. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. It wasn't very pleasant. Yeah. Yeah. And if you had supposedly led a virtuous life, you got this reward. Most people just ended up in this no man's land, and of course, if you were bad, you went to Tartarus. Mm. Yeah. There you go. Lost and Gracie for you. Thank you. <laughs> so, so the gospel message, I mean, had to be uh, welcome to a lot of folks. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, of course, as Paul talked, though, I mean, he's saying that the judgment was to come, that everyone was going to be accountable for their actions by a righteous and holy God. And uh, whereas, you know, we live kind of in a culture where most, well, a lot of people just don't believe in God in the first place. I mean, this was a pretty spiritual culture where people believed in gods and the deities and things like that. And so that was probably taken into consideration more so than probably some people today. But, but, it, but like I said, it did seem to strike a chord with Felix, and uh, he was convicted and responded not in the way that you would hope. Uh, you may now leave, and when I find it convenient, I will send for you. And so verse 26, we'll finish up here real quick. At the, at the same time, he was hoping that Paul would offer him a bribe, so he sent for him frequently and talked with him. So bribes were illegal, but they happened pretty often, and so that's what he had wanted from Paul. And he had already, already heard Paul talking about this, this, um, these alms that he had brought to Jerusalem, so he... There was, there's already some assumption that he has. He has the money. He's got some, got some funds to spare. In verse 27, when two years had passed, <laughs> man, time flies quick, Felix was succeeded, succeeded by Porcius Festus, but because Felix wanted to grant a favor to the Jews, he left Paul in prison. So this is a long period of time, right? I mean, this makes me think of Joseph and how he was in prison. And 
What's amazing from this story, I know we've been talking about some different things, but I think there's the point of application for us to think about Paul's own situation and how he was imprisoned. I mean, this is kind of what he expected going into Jerusalem, right? He expected this or something worse to happen. Um, and he, he could have tried to play to his odds and, and sweet talk and just try to get out of there and say, like, oh, I didn't mean it or something like that, and just try to get out of prison so he could get back on the streets. And maybe there is even the temptation to say, you know, well, I'll probably be able to do more good out there. When I'm, on, when I'm out of prison, I'll be able to, to preach more people, share the gospel with more, with more, and encourage the church and things like that. But instead, Paul remains faithful in his position and faithfully shares the gospel to, to Felix and to Drusilla. And he did it when sharing the gospel was not in his best interest <laughs> for a situation, at least. Like, the, this, that wasn't the thing that was going to get him his, his ticket out of jail, right? So he did that despite the fact that that was probably just digging him in a deeper well uh, and, and not actually helping him his, his physical situation in any manner. <laughs> And so he does this, and even when two years had passed, right? Gosh, I can't imagine what how, how tempting it would be to be discouraged in the midst of that, saying, like, oh, I'm just, I'm just here. I mean, I'm in prison, right? So what can I do here? And, uh, you know, has God, I don't know, maybe he was discouraged to the point of thinking, has God forgotten me or you know, being down? And once again, it makes me think of, of Joseph. But... Uh, <laughs> Just his faithfulness, even in the midst of the situation um, where he could have easily just tried to get himself out of it, he remains faithful and, and continues to preach the gospel as, as we have seen him do. I think that's an encouragement to us as well, as he considers that his eternal life is, is of much more value, and the eternal life of those he's with, he considers that of much greater value than his own comfort. So about verse 27 there, talking about the transition from, Port, from Felix to Perseus Festus. So Gardner says, The occasion was a... Uh, for two years Paul remained a prisoner at Caesarea. At the end of this period, the term of Felix came to an end. The occasion was a disturbance in Caesarea between Jewish and Gentile elements of the population. The actions taken by Felix were so anti-Jewish that the Jews sent a delegation to Rome in order to complain. Rome responded by removing Felix from office. Paul's case would now be taken up by, by a new blood raider, Horseus Festus. So that's the reason for his removal and the new placement. Okay, so that's our last last lesson there. You guys have any... Oh, number four, sorry. Fill in the blank. Though it did not benefit his own situation... Paul faithfully preached to Felix and Drusilla. Though it did nothing to benefit his own situation, Paul faithfully preached to Felix and Drusilla. Okay. Yeah. You guys have any final final thoughts there? Your last word, to, last chance to get a word in before summer. So, well, apart from the next one, sure. So, did Paul write any of his letters from Caesarea? Caesarea, uh, no, I don't think so. Oh gosh, I don't know that. I need to. That's an interesting question, though. I need to. I need to look it up. It's a good question. I mean, and we know that Paul writes. Was it, was it the Philippians when he was like, my time is pretty much coming to a close here? He's thinking that he's about to die. Was it Philippians? So I think he writes more after this, yeah. I'll, I'll write it in my notes pretty soon. Good question. Any other thoughts, sir? fashion. We finished a few minutes after time. <laughs>
when you get JR back, he'll probably be better at that time. Maybe. So, real quick, the uh, next next Wednesday, if you remember, we're meeting for the VBS work day. So, <laughs> still come. <laughs> we won't have we won't have a regular Bible study or anything like that. But you can come and bring your kids too. Um, they're they're more than welcome to come and, and help. And we'll have some pizza. And the sign-ups are out on the Welcome Center in the foyer, so be sure to sign up just so we can get a head count for how much pizza to order. But that'll be fun. That'll be good. BBS is going to be really good. I'm, I'm excited for it. And uh, it's a good thing to get involved in. And then also, I think we forgot to mention this, but if you're not involved in BBS anyway, and maybe you're like kids, ugh, uh, and you want to do something else, we do need a cleanup crew that we'll only we'll help with. We'll try to tear stuff down and, and uh, get, the, get the church back to its status quo, look-wise. Look so just keep that in your mind uh, in the next few, okay. well, soon, because it's coming up. Alrighty, does anybody want to pray? Close us out here. Thanks, sir. Heavenly Father, God, we just thank you so much for this day. You bless us with you. Thank you so much for all your love and grace that you share down on us each and every day. Father, we thank you for this study. We thank you for Ross. We just appreciate everything he does. And we know while we're studying the Bible, maybe we can learn some stuff, maybe pass it on to someone else. And Father, just go with us as we leave here tonight. Watch over us and guide us and keep us all safe till we return again. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.